And the answer that I get all the time when I'm witnessing to people, if I ask them if you were to die today and go to heaven, well, I hope so. And that is not an answer that we need. We need to know so, folks. We need to know that when we take our last breath on earth, we will take our next breath in heaven. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. We are talking today about the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem. And let me give you the outline. Only two points today. Two points. No, it's not going to be short. All right. <laughs> We're studying it verse by verse. Number one, the exterior design. That's looking from the outside. John will be looking down on the New Jerusalem at first, and then the internal character. And folks, here's where it's just going to blow your mind, you know, to be in the presence of God. And uh, I, Ramona, I'd never heard that song. That is a great song with a great message. Because people tell me all the time, what are you going to say? Well, folks, I don't think we're going to say anything when we first get there. I honestly think we'll be speechless. There is no description I can tell you today that will do justice on what heaven is going to be like. And folks, it's something we should look forward to, not something that we dread. And we will see in our scripture just what God prepared for us. You know, our final resting place is the New Jerusalem, or the place we call heaven. It is a place where God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit lives. There are millions of angels there. There are millions of believers and Christians living there. Heaven is an eternal place where we will worship and praise God for all eternity. And you know the neatest thing about worship there? There will be no distractions. None. Okay? As we, we as humans have a hard time wrapping our heads around what heaven is going to be like. God does give us a small glimpse of heaven in Revelation chapter 20, 21 and 22, but finding words to describe heaven, uh, to me, uh, words that I think of are staggering, awesome, mind-boggling, unbelievable, and overwhelming. And all of those all, the word that sticks out of my mind, unbelievable. In Revelation 21, a vision of the New Jerusalem unfolds. History has ended. Time is no more. Let's look at this incredible scripture that describes the beauty of things to come. Revelation 21, 1, the exterior design. And one of the seven angels who had seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me. And you almost wonder, why is he bringing this up? Because if you think of the angel there, the seven angels, they brought bad news. They were talking about the tribulation. We have studied that for weeks upon weeks upon weeks, all the judgments uh, that will be coming uh, to this world. And so I believe he is talking, reminding us of the bad news, and now he's going to give us the good news. And folks, don't you like good news? Ooh, that was weak. <laughs> Has the rain got you? Don't you like good news? Thank you. We're alive. We're living. We're breathing. We're going to heaven. That is good news. He came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's, li the lamb's wife. And we have talked about the bride of Christ. Uh, the Bible speaks of the bride of Christ. And this is the church, folks. And it's not only the church. And when we think of the church, we think of the Acts chapter 2, New Testament church. The bride is everyone of all ages, every Christian. Remember, this is the end. This is the last. This is the final place. This is the final stop for Christians in all centuries the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit. Folks, we are in tune with God through the Holy Spirit. We know what we should do through the Holy Spirit. We know that uh, God has prepared for us something that is very, very special. And it's the Holy Spirit that speaks to us and works in us. 
and helps us change. He carried me into the Spirit into a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. If you went to Lawton, Oklahoma, which is my hometown, and you went just north and a little west there, there's a little mountain in a refuge called, you know, uh, called Mount Scott. And to be up on that mountain uh, at night is a neat thing. And again, Lawton it isn't a huge place, but to see the lights from that place is incredible. It really is. So you compared that to heaven, you know it really isn't, okay? It is so awesome when they are looking down and seeing the lights. And one thing I've learned about this chapter, folks, what we think is lights and what light truly is, is two different things. Jesus is the light. And the brightest lights we have come up with is LED lights. Okay? And you have to understand, well, it's going to blind you. No, you'll have your glorified body. I'm telling you, the new Jerusalem was glowing with lights, I believe, descending out of heaven from God. And again, we spoke of that uh, last week. Having the glory of God. Oh, folks, we see God's glory. We just get a little glimpse sometime in our worship services. The last two weeks have been just amazing, seeing people saved and seeing people go through the baptismal waters, and we have even more to come as far as being baptized. And that is God's glory, and we need to give God glory, but we will see it in its purest form. We will see the throne of God, the throne of God, and there's all kinds of thrones in the secular world and around the world but it'll be nothing like this. We have talked about what it is going to be like, and it's going to be amazing. And when you talk about the glory of God, it says her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And we think of diamonds when we think of that, and we think of, of, of just brightness, Okay, and you put it under the light and it just shines. Verse 12, also she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. And you'll notice all the way through this chapter, things are tied with the number 12. And 12 is the, the number of completion. This is God's a home. This is the abode of God. This is where God lives. And if I have to, again, just say one word about heaven, it is perfect. And folks, you think about this world we live in, it is anything but perfect. Mankind has gone down and down. And I don't know how anyone that has any sense whatsoever, these folks that think that it's going to get better and better here on earth have not read the word of God. It's bad. Everywhere we look is bad. And God will change all of this because we are going to a perfect place. And it says with 12 gates, 12 angels at the gates. And again, the angels aren't guarding. It's not like people are going to be trying to break through the gates. Okay, it, that's God's messengers. That's God's messengers at the gate. And the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And the gates, if you think about it, there's four sides uh, to heaven. Uh, and we'll see that here in just a second. So there'll be three, there'll be three gates on each wall. And the 12 tribes of Israel, that's God's first chosen people. That is the representation of the Old Testament. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Verse 14, now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And folks, I don't believe it'll be like our foundations. When you think of a house and a place that we live, the foundation is under, all right? It is not exposed. But again, you cannot put your mind, you cannot put heaven in plans or drawings, okay? God created this special place, and the foundations on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. 
And you can see each layer had a name on that. And the children of Israel also on part of that. It, and he who talked with me had a golden ring to measure the city, its gates and its walls. And the city is laid out as a square. And when you think about this, its length is as great as its breadth. Now try to get this in your mind. It's almost like more of a cube, all right? It's 1,400 miles up, 1,400 miles across, all the way around, 1,400 miles. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length and breadth and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of man. That is of an angel. And the construction of the wall was made of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. Even some uh, authors and some writers try to figure out how much acreage we will get per person. One said, one, I'm serious, one said 37 acres apiece, Another one said 75 acres apiece. And again, folks, I'm not sure which one of those. I'll take the 75 just because it's a little bigger. All right? But what I'm saying is, folks, it's not a small enclosed area. This is a huge place. A huge place. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2 with me. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, verse 14, and here is one thing I want to point out. Folks, when we are in heaven, there will be nothing but peace. Peace. No war. No hate. No bad words. No accusations. No murder. It will be peaceful in heaven. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. And we understand they are talking about the Old Testament. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of the commandments contained in the ordinances, uh, so as to create him himself one new man from the two, making, the, making peace." And folks, God, Jesus was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. That he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. And for through him, both have access by one spirit to the Father. So one of the things that we are going to have that it, I'm, I'm telling you this world, it, it's not even close, folks. There's nothing peaceful in this world. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. What does that mean? Folks, I am telling you, God and him are equal in heaven. They are equal. He is the cornerstone. And we know what a cornerstone is. When you set a foundation, it is the one that, that you start with. And if that cornerstone is off, your whole house will be off. But we're talking about a perfect man named Jesus, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the city. Then Hebrews chapter 11. Look at Hebrews 11 with me. Hebrews 11 verse 13 says, and these all died, talking about faith. This is the faith chapter, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. And that's what I say about Old Testament folks. They had to believe in a coming Messiah. Jesus has not come yet. 
and they had to have great faith. We have that advantage of the Holy Spirit. Also here, the, we have the Bible and Jesus, uh, the history of Jesus. We know Jesus lived and died on the cross and arose for us embrace them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. You know, I found out the older I get, the stranger this world becomes. I'm serious. Things that are what people, I don't call them normal. What's going in our world is not normal. Things that you wouldn't even talk about are now on the internet or on your phones or being said in public. All right? Folks, this is not our home. Heaven is our home. Heaven is our dwelling place. Uh, they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For those who uh, say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they, are, they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. And again, we're talking about God's people. We are talking about Israel and Abraham and all the patriarchs. But now they desire a better place that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Oh, folks. God is the greatest builder there ever has been. God has built a place for his children. And I believe with all my heart, when we get there, we will be amazed at what he has built for his children. Back in our text, the Bible says in verse 19, the foundation of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. And we see here uh, 12 different kinds of stones. Some of these we are familiar with and others we are not. Uh, jasper is, is, is uh, gold-like and uh, clear as glass. The sapphire is what, what they call diamond blue. Uh, Chelsea, Chelsea Doni is uh, the sky is sky blue in color. The emerald is bright green, and again, you know these these colors are not like our colors down here. Okay, they're going to be you know uh, bright. They will illuminate. All right, the sardonyx is red and white. The sardis is reddish in color. The crystal uh, chrysolite is uh, golden in color, barrel, barrel is green, topaz is yellowish green, uh, the, the cry uh, sophorus is green, uh, the jacinth is violet, and the amethyst is purple. And it, again, that's not all the colors in our color scheme, but I'm telling you, these colors are going to be fantastic. And then look at verse 21 now. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl. I mean, you ladies that have pearl necklaces, they look nice. They really do. But when you talk about a gate, and you talk about how high gates are, one pearl, okay, it is going to be Fantastic, fantastic. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And again, we will be walking on, according to the Word of God, streets of gold. Well, we saw the exterior design there. Now let's look at the internal character. And this is, this is I mean, the, the first part is a description of it, but this part is so important, the internal character. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And when we think about the temple, we have to start with the tabernacle that was moved around in Old Testament time, and then the building of the temple. And then even now, uh, you know, the, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, all right, it's, it's church, and all those are buildings. 
but there's no need for the temple in heaven because God in Jesus will be there. They will be there. There's no need for a temple. They are the place of worship. They are who we will worship. Verse 23, and the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine it in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. And again, if you were looking from the mountain, you, you would just be amazed at how bright the city is. And when you come into the gates, all right, there's no electricity. And folks, you, you just have to realize that anything that your mind thinks of the way it might be is probably not the way it is. All right? It's not. Because we think with our mind and what's in front of us. But he, the, through this whole thing, it keeps talking about light and light and light. Jesus is light, folks. God is light. They will, right? They not only light up a room, they light up heaven. And it says, and the Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its lights. And the nations there literally means the Gentile world. Those, even though they are not Jewish by birth, all right, they will be there too if they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it. And again, folks, up in heaven, they are not going to be kings, all right? But, but he, is, he is talking about salvation is for everyone. Uh, there'll be no, you know, as far as, uh, you know, rich people or, you know, people that are, uh, you know, kings and rule over things in heaven. God and Jesus will be the rulers there. In verse 25, and its gates shall not be shut at all by day. When you think about that, and we talk about gates, uh, you think now we have, we have the, what, what the ring things, you know, the doorbell ringers where you can look out and see folks. All right. I know Steve and I'd be eating. He'll look on his phone. Hey, a package was just delivered. All right. All right. Why? You want to know when it was delivered. So, you know, these pirates come and steal your packages. All right. No need of that in heaven, folks. Ain't no thieves there, all right? I'm telling you, the gates can be wide open. What do we do when we leave our house? We turn on our alarms. Why? Because there's thieves there. There's thieves here. But in heaven, it is not. The gates can be wide open and not shut at all, and there shall be no night there. Why no night? Because night is darkness. You think about all the evil that happens at night, okay? There's a lot of evil, all right? It says, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, but there shall by no means enter anything that defiles. Folks, I am telling you, and it says, or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's why I say, folks, it's going to be a perfect place. He told us last week, no more crying, no more pain, no more sickness, no more cancer. You can just, none of that's going to be in heaven, and it's going to be wonderful. And it says, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. John chapter 1, verse 14. Let's look at the glory of God as we close here. John chapter 1, verse 14. And he's talking about Jesus. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who was Jesus? He was the Son of God. What was Jesus? He was shown mercy and truth. And when you think of His glory, he, he was a reflection of His heavenly Father. Then in Matthew chapter 17, Matthew 17, talking about the glory of God, and it's Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
17 verse 1 now after six days jesus took peter james and john and his brother and led them up to a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them even the disciples three of the disciples they got they they had the privilege of seeing jesus and look what it says he was transfigured before them his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light and we don't have time to go through there in the time allotted here but i am telling you when you looked at him he was glowing all right he is a reflection of god while he was here on earth then first peter 2 first peter 2 first peter 2 let me get there verse 4 1 Peter 2, 4, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Also, as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in this scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious and he who believes on him by will no means be put to shame therefore to you who believe he is precious folks jesus and god should be precious to you but those who are disobedient the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and folks that's what i was just amazed about the scribes and pharisees the son of god dwelt among them yet they would not believe. And it says, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They will stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. Now look at this, but you are a chosen generation. Folks, God chose you. Before the foundations of the world, Ephesians 1 says, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. We are special that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. You can see, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, there's that words again, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. And having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evil doers, they may, uh, they may by your good works, uh, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Well, what are we supposed to be doing? Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Folks, this is Jesus speaking to us even this day. You are the light of the world. Heaven is going to be lit up. And we are God's light in this world. People are in darkness. People don't believe. People are skeptic of, of religion. And by the way, we don't need religion, folks. We need righteousness is what we need. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on a lampstand. And it gives lights to all who are in the house. See, we can light up this sanctuary and we can smile and we can have joy and we can worship here, which we all should do. But folks, our light needs to be turned on every day of our life. When we go to work tomorrow, when we go to school tomorrow, we are the light that Jesus gives. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Father, thank you. Thank you for a place called heaven. And God, I just pray, Lord, that if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray that uh, today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray that they would understand that uh, heaven is forever and hell is forever. 
And God, the books are going to be open. And God, I pray uh, that, that the Holy Spirit would convict hearts of salvation this day. God, I pray for Christians today. God, I pray they understand what important it is to be light in a dark world. God, I pray that they would walk with you and talk with you. And God, I pray they would be genuine in their faith. God, I know we're not perfect, but God, I pray that we would not uh, walk in darkness, that we would be the light. God, if there's someone here that needs to rededicate their life to Christ, come for baptism, or even uh, join our church, God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict them of that today. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. God, I pray you do with it what you choose. And God, we'll be careful to give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?